Science faction is intended only for adults and as a reward for children battling severe opioid addictions. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 294. Science Faction, the origins of science. Now, this is going back from, like, modern CRISPR technology all the way back to, like, those tin cans connected with a string that you talk to. That was the beginning of science, indeed, is when you would take two tin cans, run a string to them, and use them like a phone. It was like the, you were a child in the 50s. It was, it was my beginnings of science, and it was a wonderful summer I had last summer. <laughs> How are we only doing this now on 294? Right. Did something like precipitate this? Are people just not getting it after <laughs> almost 300 this? episodes? Or like, what's going on? Every time I tune in, I think it's a show about quietness, but it's not <laughs> silence faction. What's going on? It's the number one complaint on iTunes. <laughs> this isn't quiet enough. Uh, we, of course, have our Origins of bit, where we look at the origins of a specific topic every single week. This time, we're going to do the origins of science itself. So first, you have to specify what exactly we're talking about in terms of science. And I would say this. The term science is bandied about quite a bit. Let's talk about the scientific method, because that'll help kind of break that down. So the basics of the scientific method, hypothesis, you put forth an idea on how something works. Experiment. Lord Zeno. Okay, the existence of Lord Zeno, I guess. Oh, no, be... I, I thought Scientology was part of the scientific it, oh, method. Oh, I see, I see what okay. you're going with. No, 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 not that. We're, we're doing hypothesis testing. So you'd come up with a hypothesis, think of a way to actually test this hypothesis, then carry out that experiment. When you got the results of it, you might decide, oh, man, this was new, or this is what I expected, and therefore I want to refine it by changing some of the variables. So you'd go through a refinement phase, and then eventually, after you publish, you'd want it to be replicated by somebody else in a different a non-connected group to then verify that your findings are true. Now, not all science is done this way, obviously. Observational science can't be. You know, if you are an astronomer and you're just studying the rotation of Mars, you're not conducting an experiment where you change the rotation of Mars. You're going to observe the rotation of Mars and report on it. So that's more of an observational type science. When you're changing the rotation of Mars, you're really getting into uh, super villain science. Yeah, that's that would, a completely different it's, field. It's uh, totally different. There's a lot of lasers involved. Yeah, and they usually attack Earth, not Mars. Right. It's things like just statistical analysis. You know, you can look at a whole bunch of data and come up with different statistical analysis. You're not necessarily doing an experiment. You might be toying around with the numbers, but you're not actually doing an experiment. You're looking at huge data sets and pulling out information from it based on corollaries of all these different statistics. So there are multiple ways to do science. It's not always hypothesis hypothesis testing. It's not always experimental, but that's what we think of usually when we propose the scientific method. Well, I mean, maybe uh, you're not doing hypothesis testing in all these cases, but I mean, couldn't you, if you're looking, if you're doing data mining, like you have a certain hypothesis sure. on what this data will show, and then you look at it, and you're not running an experiment, you're just collecting data, yeah. but you still have a hypothesis maybe of what you expect to see, and then sure. you do the math and see if it's there. 100%. And sometimes it's not even that, though. I mean, sometimes you literally look at a whole big data set. You have no hypothesis. Maybe you're just looking at that data set, or you, you have a hypothesis that's totally unrelated. You're not testing it at all. And all of a sudden, in the numbers, you see, oh, man, old ladies from Arizona love banging young men. This just comes out in the data. We hadn't assumed it before. I'm a gerontologist, and let me just say I agree, the, and, and that my findings have— The Arizona <laughs> Cougar papers really shocked the scientific question. World. So, you know, that's actually the name of a local paper in Arizona, I'm sure. I can say without any confirmation. <laughs> but the question is, how did we get to this point? How did we get to kind of modern scientific thought and the modern scientific method? Phrenology. We got there through shit like phrenology. That's right. Measuring skull cocaine, shapes. Yeah. Uh, uh, bullshit flaccid sciences like uh, uh, psychology, archaeology. I like the flaccid science uh, analogy <laughs> as opposed to hard sciences. <laughs> and and, and uh, I don't like that you didn't acknowledge my shot at your profession. <laughs> of course not. So to start off with, the term scientist is actually quite recent. The term scientist didn't get coined until the 19th century. You just were called gay and beat up before then. <laughs> No, up until the 1800s, there were people who were conducting what we would consider science or proto-science or whatever. They called themselves natural philosophers, which is just a, it's, it's a great name because it sounds like you're bragging about how good you are at philosophy. <laughs> like, I'm a, I'm a pretty natural philosopher. We use the term philosopher now basically to mean like, oh, your son's unemployed. <laughs> but like there was a time when philosophy got you late. Yeah. Well, I like the idea that they distinguish between natural philosophers and like silicon philosophers. You know, I, I don't care. I don't want those silicon philosophers. Yeah. No, well, I, mean, I, I took it to meant that they just, they didn't shave. They just had huge bushes. Yeah, that's all right. All natural philosopher, <laughs> no fake tits. And an afro. 
<laughs> yeah. So if you go all the way back to most indigenous societies, there's some inherent knowledge of trial and error that leads to everything from knowing what plants are poisonous to how to make ceramics to how to treat wounds. And in some cases, these are somewhat scientific investigations. You know, try that plant you die, all right, we're not going to try that plant again. <laughs> and sometimes they're very, very detailed. You know, some plants are literally poisonous in the tiniest amounts, but in just slightly smaller amounts, they might be used as a drug. That happens here with the local Kumeyaay population in San Diego. There is a plant, jimson weed, that they used uh, back in prehistoric times as a hallucinogen. And the LD50 dose isn't that much higher than the activation dose, meaning you had to get it exactly right in order to trip balls and not die. And the levels of that drug in the plant varied by the parts of the plant and the time of year. So you also had to be very precise about that. And then your own body weight. So there was this weird calculation of science that a lot of these indigenous societies figured out. And a lot of times they are in relation to drugs. When we look at, you know, people talk a lot about DMT right now. DMT they get from, from ayahuasca. They get this from a, a vine that grows someplace, right? And if you eat this vine, it has DMT in it, you trip balls, right? Except... Your stomach naturally dissolves the stuff that is in DMT, basically. My stomach is a dare officer? Like, get yes, the hell out of here, exactly. drugs. Your, your stomach is fucking Nancy Reagan. Like, Oh, fuck you, stomach. Yeah, it won't let you do this drug. You literally cannot get high no matter how much of it you eat. However, if you travel, like, literally 50 to 100 miles away is the closest point a separate plant grows and take a separate plant, which acts as an MAOI inhibitor, it keeps the elements in your stomach, the enzymes there, from digesting this, and then you can trip balls. Imagine how much trial and error had to go into figuring out that combining these two things in this fashion, and by the way, keep in mind, it oftentimes will take a few hours for this to take effect. So you have to do all of this cause and effect put together, not to mention traveling, trading with plant materials that don't necessarily last very long. You had to do all of that to discover how to get high with ayahuasca, and yet it was done. So there had to be some, probably much more advanced than we think, form of trial and error that borders on science, even in indigenous cultures. Think about the first time that happened. And, and like you, you okay, so because ayahuasca is a very physically yeah. and mentally draining experience. It lasts for a while. You shit up the whole fucking environment <laughs> you're in. For anybody who's sober watching this, you would think a demon just took right, over yeah, totally. guys. For that person to be like, you know what? Let's investigate that and do that again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As he's like cleaning feces all over his friends. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, so <laughs> so think about all of that. Like there is even things like ceramics. You know, ceramics are a lot harder to make than you think. You'd, you'd have to. I've seen to... ghosts. You need a yeah. ghost. <laughs> That's right. Like all of that stuff is difficult, knowing what uh, things are poisonous and what aren't. All of that is a lot of trial and error had to go into it and then a lot of passing down of that knowledge. A lot of indigenous societies have some form of semi-formal or formal astronomy, since uh, that system can be used as a calendar, it can be used as a map to guide you and to tell you, you know, when certain seasons are coming and all of that kind of stuff. So a lot of societies have a very in-depth, almost astronomical science that goes along with them. Certain large-scale meg megalithic societies like the Mayans come to mind right there. So when you say indigenous, are like right now, are you talking indigenous to North America, South America, because, I mean, everyone's indigenous Everybody's to somewhere. Everybody's indigenous to know, somewhere. So. I've, I've had this conversation, by the way. I've talked to people about this term. Usually what you're talking about is people who are in an area that they've been in for a long time. Now, I think the connotation is they're somewhat primitive, but people don't want to use the term primitive, so we all just say indigenous. You know, you're going to England soon, right, Bobby? Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, I think you should be really condescending to people in London, like, oh, yes, the local indigenous people <laughs> have their boiled meats. I just start, start pull, plucking hairs out of their heads. Sorry, this is for research. You wouldn't understand, savage. Their guards are so disciplined in their <laughs> protection of the queen. They sit here and take this mocking. And, you know, sometimes things like astronomy can be used for power. If you can predict certain things or tell certain things, the greatest example of this is Columbus himself. It was like literally the favor of the natives was falling from him after his ships burned. And they were like pretty pissed and he was pretty sure they were about to kill him. And he was probably really right. However, he happened to have an astronomical book with him on his voyage. I think this might have been the second voyage. He has to happen to have an astronomical book with him on his voyage, and he realized that in three days there was going to be an eclipse. So he told all the natives, God's really pissed that you guys aren't helping me out rebuild these ships, and you guys aren't giving me what I want. And if you don't do it, he's going to take the sun away in the middle of the day, two days from now. And then he stood out, as all the natives laughed at him, he stood out on the ship as the eclipse happened, and basically everybody went, this guy's a fucking god. 
we need to do what he says. And that's how we got his ships built and we made it back to Europe. And without that, there wouldn't have been nearly as big a genocide. So like literally for the sake of evil, he was able to use astronomy as a power play to kind of show this society how godly or powerful he was. I'm picturing in the days before Christopher Columbus, the ships burned, he felt like he was put in this situation. All the other crewmen are like, you're going to help us load the boat or what? You're just going to sit there and read your books. And he's like, and you know, everybody laughed at him right. until, bam, he Walter Whited the situation uh-huh. at the very end. Yeah, no, except he was a, wasn't really the super nerdy book reader as much as he was a genocidal maniac who would enslave and sexually abuse thousands of indigenous women. I didn't paint the picture well enough. That's All right, I mean. fair enough. Okay, so he's reading this book, but he also has like three indigenous women in like a Princess Leia-esque. <laughs> there you go, yeah, yeah, he's very top of the hut. Like, that's much more accurate. Um, he has like two other sailors just whipping a boy for no <laughs> yeah. reason for his own pleasure. Yeah. And if, I don't know how he got that giant man-eating worm in the boat with him. <laughs> oh, that's my friend, the Jabba. Just let him come through. He gets to do whatever he wants. That was referring to the Sarlacc, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you want to talk about what like formalized science though, that we currently have, where it starts, you'd probably go all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Specifically, Thales, around 600 BC, was considered the father of science. Basically, just because he insisted that all things had empirical explanations, and then seeking those explanations could be done through empirical methods, and in doing so, he founded the Pythagorean school, which was basically a school of people of quote-unquote natural philosophers who used empirical methods to measure things and try and explain it. He was literally the first guy to be like, hey, I don't think Poseidon is causing these waves, guys. Like, I got some (laughs) other ideas. And then literally, like, wave formation was one of the things he was studying. Like... Okay, so I'm not going to say it's not Poseidon's trident, but what if it's the way that the Earth is moving? Did he die swimming in the ocean, by the way? Because I think <laughs> that would change my view. And then, when you say father of science, I thought, like, like my first thought was, oh, he was the first guy to bang exclusively autistic women. <laughs> like, he just fathered a lot of scientists. <laughs> kind of, because he started the Pythagorean school, which really did. And through that, then we get Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, and they kind of brought in the idea of deductive reasoning. And deductive reasoning is a huge part of science. So deductive reasoning is basically starting from a broader truth and narrowing it down to smaller ones. So if I went, all mammals have fur, I am a mammal, therefore I have fur. Like it it is that level of reasoning. So inductive would be the opposite going up, right? Inductive reasoning does not always lead you to truth. If you started with something, I have fur, therefore this thing is a mammal. It doesn't always work. It can lead you to truth, but it doesn't always. Deductive reasoning, if it's done correctly, technically is always a logical path to truth. So that was one of the things that they brought into the idea of the scientific method. And we still use it almost without even thinking today. We just go, okay, this is part of this group. This is part of this group. This all makes sense. Have we run through yet what the formal steps are in the scientific method? Just briefly, the hypothesis testing. Earth, wind, water, (laughs) fire, (laughs) wind, heart. I'm never going to stop. That's my new maze, by the way. And then in Hellenistic Egypt, after, you know, the Greeks conquered Egypt and you, you had this kind of Greek scholastic tradition going through Egypt, ancient Egypt basically came up with a lot of the pharmacology techniques that we use today. They came up with examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, which we still use today. They introduced the concepts of definition, axiom, theorem, and proof, which we also still use in mathematics today. So this is, again, this is like a leeching of this Greek idealism and these Greek ideas into the surrounding areas, and then it gets developed. And that same torch got carried, again, because the Greeks conquered and went into these areas through Alexander the Great. These ideas then spread to what became the Arab and Muslim world. Thank God they did, because during the Middle Ages, when Western Rome fell, those ideas kind of went to shit, and there wasn't anybody doing a lot of advanced scientific research, and people were kind of, you know, like looking towards the a holy book for their answers. And in that time, those Muslim scholars, they carried that torch of reason and science They came up with a lot of concepts of competing experimentation. So I think one thing, you think another. Let's do experiments and figure out whose is right. And they were aided by the fact that this broad world was all connected by the single Arab language. So unlike in parts of Europe before, you could just share everything in this one language. You could translate it from North Africa all the way through the Middle Eastern areas. I know the Greeks get a lot of shit for their homoeroticism. Uh So I'm not punching down. I'm not, you know, Greeks thought what they thought was hot. I agree with a lot of that. Awesome. Hot, tight male bots. Rock on. But what they essentially did from that perspective was they queer-eyed the rest of the world. They went in and said, you know what? You guys are doing things wrong. Let us help you out. Let us help you out. They came in. I mean, yes, they brought an army with them as well. But but they also redecorated closets. Yeah. They helped you shave that beard, look tight. (laughs) Right. 
Yeah, maybe they did. They brought a lot of they, the Hellenistic traditions came with them. Help their marriages? Absolutely. Yeah, and in, in the same time, in places like China, you had math and science starting, the proto science started to burgeon as well. China did a lot with mathematics and the concept of zero and negative numbers. So this was kind of a, a worldwide thing at this point. And eventually that led in Europe, and especially in the Western European tradition, to the Enlightenment. And we had ideas coming from guys like Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton and Descartes, all of which got refined through the 16 and 1700s into a formalized thing that then became the scientific method. We have since improved on that general idea with things like publications of major scientific journals, the separation of different sciences. So we're not just natural philosophers now. Now you have biologists and you have engineers and you have different people doing different specific subsets of science and standardized methods of practice throughout different disciplines. Things like the ideas of recognizing a placebo and how it can affect things and therefore coming up with controls and things like double blinding. All of these are kind of steps that we've taken to get to where we are. And part of saying this is so that everybody realizes science isn't done evolving. It's not like we've gotten to this point now and we figured it out. We know exactly how to do everything and how to figure out the world around us. No, we are continually refining this. We're making it better and better. This Pokemon's got room to grow. It absolutely does. You know, we, we talked about everything from how we're figuring out different things about the placebo, one of our big stories of 2018, and how that's going to change how we do science because we're figuring out the placebo doesn't affect everybody equally, to things like scientific ethics, which are a huge part of science nowadays. You can't do half the stuff you did even in the 70s and 80s. You couldn't get through an IRB now. And so that idea of ethics in science is also becoming part of the, the evolution of science itself. Well, big supervillain keeps... Uh ethics off the science board keeps it off uh, out of Congress. So You know, most of the world we have now is given to us in some form or another from this concept of science and the scientific method. You know, it's not just cell phones and technology and space flight. It's not just hopping on an airplane or driving a car. Just the concept of the world we have, where we don't look up in the sky and go, it's dark, God must be pissed. We can go, oh, I realize there's precipitation in the air and it, there's a jet stream here. We can put together the reasoning behind things. And just the idea, think about this, just the idea there is a reasoning behind it, that it's not the arbitrary nature of a capricious God. Just that idea itself is a scientific mindset, and it's actually rather new. It's funny to think how recent some of these things are and where it's taken us. We are evolutionarily almost no different than we were in the 1400s. We are the same species, same exact thing. If you took a guy from the 1400s, brought him here, cleaned him up, you would not be able to tell the difference. He'd be indistinguishable. He'd be small. I mean, yeah, you're, you're malnourished. Just, you're just right. Slight gentleman. What separates our culture from theirs is essentially this idea. This mindset, the idea of being able to explain things empirically, being able to investigate things empirically, figuring out the secrets of the world around you based on this idea of hypothesis and experimentation and testing and, and retesting and confirmation, all of that has given us the world we live in. We've mentioned on the show that there's a phenomenon where uh, society grows more intelligent over time. Sure. So wouldn't that guy from the 1400s set himself apart by being a fucking idiot? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. There's actually a bunch of evidence that people in indigenous societies, Connor's favorite word, people in indigenous societies actually have higher IQs than we do. Okay, okay, I, okay. I'm picturing like the guy who cleaned up shit in, in, right. like, in fucking whatever London, whatever crap hole London was well, but in here's, indigenous society. But here's what, I'm, here's what I'm saying, though. One of the reasons we think that is is because in indigenous in societies, stupid people don't get to breed, right? It's only in modern societies that we allow stupid people to breed. In those societies, if you're dumb, they either off you or nobody wants to mate with you. Well, we need somebody to clean up the shit, don't we? <laughs> and since we have talked about before how incredibly inheritable intelligence is, that's a big deal. If you cut out the bottom 10% from the breeding population, not only because they're going to die, but because then they also can't be given mate choices, you are actually going to have a much higher average IQ. You act as if the dumb gene we currently experience our society Side just sprang out of nowhere. <laughs> it's like this, like oh man, everybody. Uh, That's just... part of the normal variation. But when you allow the dumb people to breed over and over again, then you get idiocracy. That documentary we watched the other day. But I mean, I feel like it's not necessarily a, a biological thing of what we were capable of, capable of, you know, then or now. A lot of mm -hmm. it is just the technology and knowledge we sure. have available to us. So I mean, I feel for science, some of the biggest things that have helped us along are knowing what to control and advancements in measurement. Sure. So like knowing to control for the placebo effect or knowing yeah. that 
there's a microbe floating around that can contaminate or infect something. If you weren't aware of that, you couldn't measure that microbe was there. There's no way you could explain some of the things you might observe when you're running an experiment. Forget whether or not you can even see the microbe. The idea that a microbe is the cause of your sickness as opposed to, again, an angry god or something you've done wrong to the karmic nature of the universe, you know? That simple idea, empiricism, that idea that the world around you is materialistic and and materialistic causes make the world around you, that simple concept is the stepping stone to it. Now, obviously, you can't build a LIGO detector to find gravitational waves until you get to certain levels of astronomy and technology before that, right? So there's always a step you have to have beforehand. But just that simple mindset switch has taken us in a few hundred years further than our ancestors went in many, many millennia. Welcome to Science Faction, the intro. Right, the longest intro ever. (laughs) All right, and speaking of the longest intro ever, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, my comedian, Mr. Damian Mercado. Damian, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. By the way, there might be a whole spinoff podcast we do where we just talk about the origins of science, just steps along the way. Because, I mean, we could have kept going, I feel. We absolutely could have. There was a lot more to do there. And our scientist for the evening, Connor. Connor, how you doing? Good, good. Uh, I didn't tell you guys before, but I do have a New Year's resolution. What is it? That well, so let's see if I can follow through. But so you know, I listen to a bunch of podcasts, mm-hmm. but I'm like a podcast leech. I don't really actively participate. So for my podcast, I listen to. I'm gonna go review and write a comment. All right, or bad. I like so, it. I, I have a quick question for you, Connor. I understand that you don't do that to a lot of podcasts, but is there one podcast you've done that to perhaps before this day? One podcast? No, I can literally <laughs> think of no podcast that I've done that for. All right, get Bill on the phone. We're gonna... All right, you guys, don't <laughs> be like... That. We're going to, going to the bullpen. All right, guys, don't be like Connor. Go ahead and review our podcast and write us a comment. You can check out our website at www.thesciencefaction.com. But for now, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Article number one, can an established science denier become science's best advocate? Are you begging Alex Jones to come back? Does Alex Jones realize some things? Oh, that's true. Alex I was the gay and the frogs that I wanted to see. First of all, we should probably review science denialism briefly. So science denialism is any form of a group of people stating that some form of established and repeatable and, and pretty secure science is somehow wrong and usually doing so providing little to no actual empirical evidence. So how do you differentiate? Because, you know, part of science is mm-hmm. skepticism and, sure. you, know, you know, being questioning what's presented to you. So how do you, where's the line? For- Which is exactly what science denialists say. So now I'm going to look at Connor a little skeptically. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. We have to, as part of science, it's com- using competing ideas and competing proofs and constantly challenging those who are putting forth new ideas. So how do you differentiate? And that's a big idea in talking about science denialism. One of the ideas is, are you actually citing evidence? So is it evidence that you're citing? So here's these Buzz feed articles are a type of evidence. Right. Those of you guys who have followed us for a while will know that I'm particularly familiar with the flat earth people. And so here's a great one. Do flat earthers cite actual scientific research? No, they don't. Uh, YouTube videos yeah, and a lot memes. Of, exactly. Or, or the misinterpretations of things that were published in the 1800s, like that kind of stuff. That is what they cite. So are they actually citing and contributing to the literature? Is there an actual scientific controversy? So for there to be a scientific controversy, what you need is competing publications that are constantly going back and saying, look, we found this. It's contrary to this thing. We found this. It's contrary to this. And by the way, this is, like you said, how science works. Usually the way it works is we found this. It's contrary to what you found. We found this. It's contrary. And then assuming those get validated by other groups groups, and those are both true, what they usually find is not that these are contrary to one another, but they specify one another. In the same way that quantum physics doesn't refute Newtonian physics, it specifies it. Yeah, Newtonian physics works, except in this case, when we get to the really small level, now all of a sudden Newtonian physics doesn't work anymore. Does that mean Newton was wrong? No. He was still right about what he was talking about. We just found specific cases where he is wrong. So in that same sense, in science, that's usually how it goes. With denialism, though, it's usually looking at the body of research and saying, no, this isn't true, and not no, this isn't true because we have empirical evidence, but no, this isn't true because we believe that the people who are saying it is true are somehow biased, they're paid off, they're shills, they're the people who are trying to trick us and make us think this is reality when it's not. They're trying to trick us by going to school for many, many years and living (laughs) unexciting lives trapped in laboratories. That's exactly correct. Obviously, there's a lot of different types of science denialism. The big ones that you would hear, obviously, we just mentioned flat earth denialism. That's not as common. 
There's a lot of things like creationism. That's that's this is just, America. Just say yeah, there's a large percentage of this country. That's that... blatant science denialism. There's things like people who deny anthropogenic climate change. Vaccines cause autism. Vaccines, that's a good one. Vaccines cause autism. Jane Goodall and her believing that Bigfoot is real, which is a real thing. Part of some cryptozoology, things like that, indeed. Well, episode idea. Have we ever considered doing an on-site recording of science faction at the Creationist Museum in East County? I did do a paper on that when I was doing my master's work on, on that creationist museum. And uh, let me tell you, the people there are really nice. I mean, horribly misinformed, but quite nice. Uh, if you'd like, um, I think I know Miss Jane Goodall. I believe we could arrange an interview with her if you'd like to question her. At any about, point about, about her cryptozoology I, I could bring her in this episode if you want, but if you'd like to schedule something. To, we'll have to, to schedule something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, she's bursting in. <laughs> now she is. And in the case that we're about to talk about, anti-GMO or genetically modified organisms. So what are some of the dangers of science denialism? Well, in the case of anti-vaccine denialism, the death of your kids, that's one. In the case of things like creationism, it is basically an illiteracy towards science. And what we see is that pervades people. You can't grow up with a creationist mindset and then go on and be a successful person in other forms of science and engineering at least not very easily, because you're going to have to come to terms when you go into the higher levels of education with the things you're wrong at. And if you're not able to accept those things, oh, I'm wrong, the evidence is totally on my side, then you're never really going to make a good scientist, even if your field is physics or something that has nothing to do with evolutionary biology. So it pervades the mind and puts in it the idea that facts don't matter. That empiricism that we just said our world is based off of is not actually that important because the story that we have is much more important. So believe the story and not the facts. Science denialism can have like those kind of real impacts. I got sick. I got polio. I got the flu because I didn't want to get a vaccine. It can have those broader conceptual impacts. I don't trust truth and reality the way I should because I was taught a creationist mindset. Everybody thinks I'm crazy because I post flat earth memes. Yeah. Or it can have broad impacts where you're doing the opposite of what you want. And that's in the case of this GMO things. A lot of times people who are anti-GMO happen to also be environmentalists, including the guy we're about to talk about. As we just covered a few weeks ago, we have found in multiple studies that non-GMO crops are much worse for the environment. It takes more land, more resources, more water for them. And if you do all of that, you are causing more damage to the environment and therefore if you are saying, I'm going to be an anti-GMO advocate because I really care about the environment and its causes, you're actually doing the opposite. So in that case, it is changing your impact on the world in the opposite direction of what you want. So there can be a lot of negative consequences to science denialism. Where I don't get science denialists is that these are guys who pride themselves on being truth seekers. I mean, if you if you ask them at the core, they of do them, seem to say that a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah but like in pra it's the biggest case of hypocrisy. Right. It's like when you say you're a fair host and I call BS. Like it's it's just yeah. So wait, when, when in fact I am too fair to you, as everybody yep. points out, I give you too much of an advantage over the scientists. I let you pick first. Everybody is smiling and nodding, like yeah. you're just saying, if you go to Antarctica, there's an ice shelf. And right. Nobody can't right. sail off it. So the following is an article that was just published this week about the case of a guy named Mark Linus. Mark Linus was a British environmentalist who was an anti-GMO advocate because he thought that his environmental advocacy led him to being anti-GMO. However, he became convinced by the evidence that he was wrong, and he did something that we should all applaud and hope that we could do ourselves when finding out we're wrong, which is he publicly came out and said, I am wrong, and here is why. And he actually gave a speech at a conference in 2013 outlining what he was wrong about, why he was wrong, and what changed his mind. I'm still waiting for your I Call BS apology, by the way. And we can deliver it at a conference, live on this podcast. Sure. Perhaps you sure. can do it on Rogan. I don't I'm, care. I'm really sorry, everybody, that I give Damien so many opportunities this to succeed. Instead of well. making it a level playing field, I always put him on the high end of the teeter-totter. And it's the only thing I can do to help him try and win once. He is, again, he is the special needs kid who got to step on the field for the NFL game. And everybody, all the defense cleared out of the way so he could run the touchdown. I'm clearing out of the way, and he just keeps trying tripping over himself. You also the ref who keeps blowing the whistle in my face afterwards. You could just, if, if nobody touched me, I'm not down. Uh, that was the worst apology speech I've ever heard. I think that's actually called a fuck you speech. <laughs> yes. I think. All right, say, save it for I call BS. Come on, come on. <laughs> So he gave this speech, and some researchers in the last few years were wondering, I wonder how this impacts people who are very anti-GMO, especially those for environmental reasons. All right, so so he presented at a conference. Which conference did yes. he present? Was it a pro-GMO conference? Uh, you know, sort of. It was a science conference, so you could so call not, it not necessarily the audience you'd no, want to hear. No, exactly. Okay, exactly. Okay. <laughs> but the idea wasn't the audience of the specific speech he gave. The idea is going to be this study, which used the tape from that specific speech he gave. 
So wait, if you if you were in the audience waiting for this speech to happen, like you showed up to this conference and you heard that this uh, anti science quack, right. as far as you know, to this yeah, day was sure. crazy, I'd be like, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> My presentation was canceled, so this asshole? The researchers decided to show a group of anti-GMO advocates three video clips. One was this guy, Linus, explaining the benefits of GM crops. The second was him discussing his prior beliefs and changing his mind about GM crops. And the third was exp was him explaining why his beliefs changed, including the realization that the anti-GM movement he helped to lead was a form of anti-science environmentalism. So the research found that both forms of the conversion message, which was that second and third one, were both more influential than simply stating the advocacy message. And there was no difference in impact between the basic conversion message and the more elaborate one, meaning both of those last two ones worked essentially equally as well. So why was this effective? That's what they want to know. One, is it effective? Yes, it is. Why is it effective? Now they have to theorize about it. Is it because these people relate to him more because he was like them? Is it because he is answering specific questions they have? Is it because he has some kind of inherent authority because he came from the same side of the aisle as it's them? Or is it because he, like them, have a common cause in environmental activism? And so they go, okay, well, the environmental activism is the most important thing. That's more important than this anti-GM thing. If he's on that side and he changed his mind, then maybe that leaves the door open for me. I mean, maybe it's just him saying he was wrong. And, you know, maybe it's him coming out and saying, I changed, I did the research. I changed my mind. That act of humility sure. might win. Yeah, lower. absolutely. Maybe he had his dick out in two of them. I don't know. <laughs> First, I'm going to tell you why I did it. And now... <laughs> <laughs> you probably wonder why I have my dick out. Well, it's because I was wrong about GMOs. <laughs> So the researchers found that they, when they questioned the people who changed their mind, they found that the people believed that the second two messages enhanced Linus's perceived argument strength rather than bolstering his personal credibility, which they found a very important distinction. So they're not saying he personally is more credible to me because he came from the same background I came from. He also believed what I believed. That they said is, I believe his argument is stronger. Keep in mind, this did not occur in the in the other groups when he was just stating the facts. So it's the same guy stating the same facts. They didn't believe him when he was just a guy stating the facts. But when the group of anti-GMO people saw him present the flip side, his conversion story, they said what changed their mind was perceived argument strength. Now, you might be thinking that's a contradiction. The argument strength is the same no matter what. He hasn't added more of an argument strength by saying I started from someplace else and had a conversion. However, we're not talking about what actually changed their minds. We're saying the perception of these people. What do they perceive as what changed their mind? This is a really important distinction because it means that when we're trying to tailor these arguments, we do want to mention, hey, look, here's a conversion story, but we don't want to focus on you, you relating to this person. We're going to focus at the end of this story on, now, how do you think the strength of this argument is? Because that is what they're perceiving to change their mind. Even if it's not, that's what they're perceiving to change their mind. So if you want to give somebody that open door to change their mind, you present the conversion story and you ask them to assess the strength of the argument itself. They will naturally assess it as much higher because of the conversion story, but they won't know that. So it's almost like somebody has given us a trick, a Jedi mind trick to use against anti-GMO people who care about environmental advocacy. I feel like we're late to the punch here because I feel like the dark side has been using this tactic for a bit. I mean, yes, the guy who rants and raves about the flat earth on YouTube is going to convert some. But if he says, I used to work at NASA. <laughs> right. And I used to believe all this as he rants and raves yeah. hysterically without a hint of autism. Well, you know what's funny is they were actually talking about this. They only went one way. They didn't try it the reverse way. They didn't try and do the anti-science thing, which I think might actually be a problem going through an IRB. <laughs> like, yeah. They might have the internal review board being like, if you are successful at this, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> But I think I think they already do it. I mean, like, like have you seen the videos posted by crazy people? It's always says like government agent. Like they yeah. they, they go off some sense of authority. That right. Well, I think that's also a misunderstanding of science itself. They think that scientists believe things because other scientists say it, as opposed to because the evidence supports it. And that's just an ignorance of science. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting ideas is how does this tie into what we know about addressing scientific denialism? When I was going through my grad work in science in the public, they were telling us, you don't want to talk to pseudoscientists. You don't debate creationists because all you're doing is giving them a platform that adds legitimacy to it. And there's a lot of scientific studies that seem to back that up, that seem to show that once you address and engage with people who are engaged in scientific denialism, you essentially add legitimacy to what they're doing to an outside audience. 
Ken Ham here, you know, I'd like to say. Oh, Mr. Ken Ham, the famous creationist from New Zealand. Yes, yes, uh, I'll, I'll wholeheartedly disagree with you. I think that uh, we, uh, those of us who are scientists in our own right, perhaps not mainstream scientists, uh-huh. like you certainly guys, aren't a mainstream scientist. Like, Ken like Ham. you three uh-huh. in this room, but uh, but but if you don't debate us, how will you know you're wrong? For example, if I had not been able to debate Bill Nye several years back, uh-huh. how would he have known how wrong he was about the Word of Christ? He absolutely wouldn't have known. Well, I think public perception, at least certainly my inner circle, tell me I won that. You know, I've always been somewhat skeptical of this idea. I can see why it's there, but as, you know, as we talked about earlier, I participated two years ago in the Flat Earth debate where I went out and actually debated a person who believed the Earth was flat in a public forum. By the way, most tickets we ever sold to a fucking comedy show ever, <laughs> ever packed that house out. We did, Damien and I did a, a weekly comedy show in that venue for three years and never had half the audience we had for that debate. Well, we never had a heel. We never had, right. like, we never had somebody coming into the supervillain like, oh, I hate everything you guys love. But I got to pin him down on some things that he didn't know and couldn't explain and etc and i think while that might not make a difference to him i'm not actually debating him i'm debating the people at home who see three youtube videos and they're on the dumber side so they might be swayed but if i can just shoot down those arguments then i've helped out and that's what i think we need to focus on it's not always that you're having a debate or a scientific debate to try and change that person's mind that's going to be very rare it's very rare somebody's going to walk off the stage with a state change mind but if you can shoot down the arguments in a public enough forum and show they have no response to it you can affect the audience and in the digital media age that audience can be millions of people and so i think the idea of not engaging with science denial denialists is wrong i think we have to be careful when we do it we have to make sure we're not adding legitimacy to it you have to be very detailed in what you're doing however I think that you do want to, in some senses, engage with it. And like this particular thing says, one of the ways to do that might be finding people who used to believe in that, changing their minds or maybe having their minds changed on their own, and then presenting those people as the ones to go out and talk about it. Is it ethical to lie about being, <laughs> about being converted, converted, you know? I don't think so because I think that will come out. You know, I think there's a difference between, hey, I remember seeing this guy on all the Facebook groups. He's talking about the flat earth and taking pictures with this, you know, P900 cameras and all this kind of stuff. And then now all of a sudden I see that he is he, this guy who was like me is thinking this other thing. One thing that happened when you had that flat earth debate was that when he said something stupid, people laughed in real time. Yeah. So maybe science needs to do this. Every time they, they do engage the science denialist, right. but every time the science denialist talk, I don't care if it's if it's post production, whatever, but they had a laugh track. Just to put it in uh-huh. laughing hysterically at whatever. It's, that from, means. it's from like the nineteen eighty nine Cheers episode. <laughs> just put it in. It's like married with children. People are wooing. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> All right, on to article number two. A mystery hominid had modern tooth growth. Very, very interesting. This hominid that was around in China from 100,000 to 200,000 years ago is actually a hominid we've never discussed before, even when we did our intro bit as the different hominids. Is this you coming clean about your laziness, or do you just want to get to the next bit? No, it's because we don't actually know what this is. This is just kind of put in this group that we have of unknown hominids that we have found, and we don't have enough evidence to say what they are because we don't have enough of the skeleton, and they're also in a weird place at a weird time, and we can't tell exactly what's going on. So this comes from China uh, about 100, 200,000 years ago. The hominid doesn't even have a name because, we, again, we don't know what it is. So they refer to it by the province in China it was found. And I'm not even going to try and pronounce this fucking province because I have no idea how to speak Chinese. So instead, because it starts with an X, we're just going to call it hominid X. I want everybody at home to know that as he did that, he did like the suck it sign. Like yeah, the that, X that was, sign. That, that yeah. was like, but like across his crotch. That's right. Very crass. That's right. And it's, it's an audio medium as well. The audience can't see that. Damien, what does hominid X sound like? Probably sounds a lot like DMX. <laughs> He's going to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great if that's actually what that hominid did sound like. What? <laughs> So these were found starting from the 1970s. We found 20 hominid fossils across two sites in this place. It consists of 12 parietal bones, which is the side of the skull, one temporal bone, which is kind of the side and up a little bit, two occipitals, which is the back of the head, one mandibular bone fragment, which is the jaw, and one juvenile maxilla, which is like the top part of your mouth, as well as three isolated teeth. Here are some of the interesting things about this particular thing and why we can't tell what this is. So it has a thick brain case and large teeth that most resemble the traits of Neanderthals and Homo erectus. Yet the shapes of several cheek teeth look like they most correspond to Homo sapien. That's weird. They have a mixture of dental features from different species. So the colleagues thought that it might be either some kind of hybrid. It might also have some Denisovan in there. 
the fossils have this kind of weird mixture of these different features that we haven't seen in any other single species before. When this happens, you've mentioned tons of interbreeding between yes. the species. We know it's happened in Homo sapiens, yep. but you've also mentioned that th at this time, this was a Middle Earth type kingdom. Right. There just were tons of other hominid species running around. Exactly. Dwarves and giants, everything. And so there, so uh, you've mentioned we have a ton of unidentified species. So basically, anytime it's, are we just looking at half breeds? Like, like the it John could be. Snows and that's, world, that's uh, kind of what the thought is right now. We think it might be some kind of crossbred thing between a Denisovan and a Neanderthal or Homo sapien or Homo erectus. We don't know yet. But the mixture of features is really weird. It's not something you would expect. Normally, you see kind of a progression of features in a certain direction. This type of mixture of both teeth and skull features is super weird. And it got weirder this week. Because this week, they just published an analysis of the tooth growth of one of the children, who's about six years old. And the tooth growth cycle of this kid was almost identical to that of modern Homo sapien. That's really weird. That's a very different tooth growth cycle than both Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo erectus. So if you were to say this is a mixture of Neanderthal and Denisovan, well, then how the fuck does it have Homo sapien tooth growth cycles? And if you're going to say it's Homo sapien, we don't really have evidence of Homo sapiens anywhere near that place at that time. Was there a Homo sapien milkman working that neighborhood at that time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fossils that were found, was it from one individual or multiple? Multiple. 20 fossils that we know come from at least a few different individuals because some are juvenile and some are not. Okay, so it wasn't like there was a weird uh, genetic abnormality, just a Here's what's funny you say that. There actually was evidence of a very unique genetic abnormality, which is a hole in the parietal bone in the skull, which we find in Homo sapiens at a rate of like one out of 25,000. So there is a weird click in there of like, fuck, what's going on here? Is this guy exhibiting something that was more common in other hominids than it is in modern Homo sapien populations? One in 25,000 people I meet has a hole in the side yeah. of their skull. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a genetic condition. You'd never know. They don't get to play contact sports, do they? <laughs> <laughs> no, because like the muscles that guide a lot of the, your jaws and stuff kind of cover that area, so you wouldn't really know There's about it. There's not cerebral spinal fluid just leaking out of that hole. No, no, that's not how that works. In addition to the bones themselves, they also found almost 30,000 lithic bone and antler artifacts in the same area. Uh, the tools included scrapers, points, gravels, anvils, choppers, and spheroids. All of these are of a tool technology we could expect from everything from Homo erectus through Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens. You went through a, a lot of tools or at least descriptions of what a tool would do. Then right. you got to spheroid. Yeah. Is that, is that an, an ancient anal bead or something? That's exactly <laughs> what it is, Damien. They would use this to spice up ancient marriages. One of the problems they would have is sometimes the string broke on the ancient spheroid, and then you have to go to the ancient doctor. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, the ancient ER saw a lot of ancient light bulbs up there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was essentially the Homo sapien with the thinnest fingers. <laughs> like kind of, or a prehensile dick. Uh, <laughs> Leave the laugh in from Connor, because otherwise it just seems like I said something and no scientist laughed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically lines that form in the teeth at regular intervals during childhood mark enamel layers that accumulate daily and over long periods of time. The ex hominid child's age and dental growth rates were calculated by counting the enamel layers, and real, and that's how we figured out they had basically the same tooth growth cycle that modern Homo sapien does. Again, very interesting. I think, my personal opinion is, we have seen that there were some ancient Homo sapiens that made it into Eurasia. Even though they don't contribute to the modern genome, they went extinct. I think there's a possibility one of these guys interbred with either Neanderthal, Denisovans, maybe even Homo erectus, very ancient uh, species. And that's where you get these particular individuals. I think that's incredibly interesting because it tells this weird story of like a long migration, a mating of a group that died out. Not just the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Homo erectus that died out, but that line of Homo sapien died out as well. Is it possible that this Homo sapien-like tooth growth cycle in children came from sitting on the wrong toilet seat at the wrong time? That's probably what happened. Gotcha. Fair yeah. Enough. Uh, it also fits in with another big story that came out this week about our ancient DNA, looking at ancient DNA and using AI technology to kind of look through all of the data. They were able to determine that, in fact, we have another, not necessarily Neanderthal, not necessarily Denisovan, hominid ancestor that interbred with Homo sapiens and made its way into the modern lineage. And we can tell it by looking at all these snippets of DNA from thousands and thousands of different people and going, hey, this little clip here, this came from something. It's not quite Neanderthal, not quite Denisovan. One of the ideas is it might be a hybrid Neanderthal-Denisovan population that lives somewhere, but who knows? Maybe it's Homo erectus. There's also the red deer people, another mysterious hominid from China. Who knows what it is? But at some point, we are going to figure out what this is, again, probably through more advanced genetic testings, or maybe we'll actually find remains of them, and that will, again, fill in this story. Maybe 
maybe it's actually this group. Maybe this X hominid is the unknown contributor. Do you know, so for this study where they looked at, you know, the DNA of yeah. ancient hominids, how big their reference panel was to do that analysis on? Because, I mean, now, you know, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, sure. those DNA tests are getting really popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they did identical not... twins can take the same test sure. and get different distributions of, you know, but where that's they... that has more to do with the process of 23andMe than it does our ability to actually look at genetics. So... The thing about what they're doing when they're looking at these broad populations, they're looking at literally thousands of genomes, and they're using AI to pull out these little snippets of repeating genomes that indicate an ancient ad fusion of a different species. And then they can kind of put them together and match them and be like, oh, man, this is, this is mainly Southeast Asia. And they match them up. And they go, okay, we see this. It's, we don't see these the same in, intermixture in Africa. We don't see it in Western Europe. We only see it in these parts of Southeast Asia and then diaspora that came after that. So we are able to say not only when it happened, likely, but where it happened, which is also really interesting. I mean, but just like how the algorithm from 23andMe may not be spot on, I mean, could, there, be, could there be error in this too? Uh, you wouldn't find that error over thousands of people. So no, not not in that same way. It would just it wouldn't be conceivable that you would be able to have this infusion into the to the genome of of this wide group of people. If you could get everybody on the planet to take a twenty three andme or similar genetic test, mm -hmm. and you had the correct AI, could we re reverse engineer? Yeah, I actually think that's human... a great that's a great question. I I actually think about that a lot. You know, w could we build a a family tree of all people on earth. And I think theoretically you could. Theoretically, if you had that data, you could and you'd also find a lot of those milkman scenarios because <laughs> there's a lot of people who aren't the genetic progeny of the people they think they're ge the genetic progeny of. So, oh my god, Genghis Khan is my <laughs> Um so earlier we talked about how um, within the scientific method, ability to control and measure things has mm -hmm. really advanced the pace at which we sure. can do science. So, in the terms of something like archaeology and you know looking at the enamel what's like the next measurement tool you oh, think it's a good question that would help advance you know the science so that's a really good question a few of them are going to be dating techniques radiometric dating techniques right because you've all heard of carbon dating but now we have more precise ones argon argon dating potassium argon dating match.com match.com yeah yeah and, and tinder of course uh, uh that's just there if you just if you just want to fuck some genes yeah that's right <laughs> But there's also some interesting stuff we just talked about in like the top stories of 2019, the ability to find human fecal particles in the sediments of lake beds to be able to tell when Homo sapien made it to an area. That's a huge one. I think a lot of the stuff looking at the microscopic evidence of human beings, the things they leave behind in sites is going to tell us a lot. And then being able to pull DNA from that kind of stuff, if we ever can pull it from coprolites and some of this, you know, old feces and that kind of stuff, is going to be able to allow us to do kind of what Damien is talking about, make a family tree of those ancient people. And that's really hard to do currently. It will also help give value to my extensive coprolite collection. That is true. Currently, I cannot unload on eBay. And by the way, they are not coprolites if they are fresh. All right. Thank you, <laughs> <They're audience. moving. laughs> Thank you audience, for coming back for Science Faction 294, where you learned about the origins of science how an established science denier can become science's best advocate, and how a mystery hominid had modern tooth growth in ancient China. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 295. Yes, you rude American, I am indigenous to the island. No, that's not firewater, it's gin. And no, that's not a teepee, it's Buckingham Palace. Show some respect. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Bye.